right, tell me about the movie itself. How, how did you get into this is a producing this film? The school needed some kind of film documentary itself to to be used to prom somewhat to promote the school, but mostly just to inform people about the school. And they had a little bit of money, you know, put together for what they call a dissemination piece. And, you know, before they've done slideshows and things, but this year you asked me if I wanted to do a movie. And I said, well, maybe. And, you know, so we had enough to do a 16 millimeter sound, you know, documentary on the school. Uh, ALP, or the Alternate Learning Project, is Providence's fifth high school. It's part of the Providence school system. But unlike most of the other high schools, it's has a rather unique building and a unique philosophy of its own. It's working out of an old bowling alley in downtown Providence, across from Phoenix Boston Radiator Company, and a school that was designed and built by students and staff together. It began, let's see, in fall of 1971, with about 60 students, off of an effort by a group of parents and concerned and interested school system people to find and develop an, an alternate model for secondary schooling in the city. As I said, we began with about 60 students. Our second year, which is this year right now, we're up to about 100, and our third year we're hoping to go to about 125. The project itself is funded out of EFEA Title III funds through the State Department of Education and in part by the city school system itself. The school essentially is divided into seven major areas of, of both study and, and experience for the students. As part of your work in education, you've been spending up to 12 hours a week working at a daycare center. Um, what have you learned about children's needs from that work? Well, you know, there's so much that you learn about kids, first of all. But I find that they need most is love, you know. But seems like everything comes down to that, and patience, and understanding. I, f I find that sometimes it's very hard to be patient with these children because it's, they're so young that, that they, I don't know, they, they just slow. You've got to explain things, and, and they ask so many questions, and, and you always have to have the answers. Have you learned something about your own capabilities in dealing with children? from this work? Yeah, I learned that I can, if I set my mind to it, I can work effectively with them and, and be patient with them and just help them out when they need help. Um, what have your frustrations been in working at the daycare center? Well, I think it's, it can be a really nice place for these kids, but I don't know, I think the staff there are very uncooperative and and they complain a lot. They don't have a real understanding of kids and what kids like and how they act at this age. They they seem to stress to the children, don't play so much. You need to grow up. It's getting too big to be doing that. I I don't think they're giving these children time to just be children. And they and I don't know, they're not working hard enough, I don't think, to make this a nice daycare center for them. Um, what, what have you, can you talk about some of the things that the children have been, have been doing and things that you've been doing with them? Well, since it's just a daycare center, you know, trying to keep them occupied and we end up playing with them and letting them play by themselves, puzzles and, and games and just building things with blocks. And the girls, like, some of the little boys too like to play around the kitchen area they have with dolls. And we exercise them and, and we get them to sing and kind of teach them manners, you know, kind of respect each other. And I'm, I don't know, I just, I'm busy around there doing a whole lot of things. What was it like adjusting to ALP at first, when you first entered? Mm -hmm. Well, it was, you know, kind of hard. I didn't know what was expected of me. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. There was no one telling me what to do, first of all. 
and and it was like I was sitting around waiting for everybody else to start start things going, get things rolling, you know, building the place, painting and whatnot. But after a while, I I kind of got into my head. Well, this is our school, and if if anything's going to be done, to it's, it's up to us. And so, you know, kind of got involved. Did you find uh, dealing with the ability to make your own choices and to make your own decisions a difficult thing? No, because that's what I knew this. I knew that this is what school was supposed to be about and that this is what I wanted from the school to be able to make the choices and the decisions because I was, you know, pretty fed up with people making it for me. How has your working with children uh, changed your thinking or made you think more about the kind of parent that you'd like to be? Well, it's, you know, it's given me the experience, first of all, of being around children and learning the different ways and the stages they go through. And it, it kind of makes me look forward to when my child starts growing up and, and I'm going to be around experiencing this more fully, you know, more so than I can at the daycare center because, first of all, these children are not related to me. And I can look at my child and say, well, that's part of me. I've, I've made you kind of a thing. I know that you had a site placement last year at the police station and that you're working there again this year. Can you tell us something about that? Well, when I first came last year and I told the director, Larry Paris, that I was interested in law enforcement, um, it took us roughly six months to uh, open the doors to police station for AOP. There was one department who did uh, let the students in, that was the control center where I'm working now, and it was after we took the tour and everything, it was down to five kids who went up, and we worked up there, and after that year was completed, I went up again this year myself, I'm the only one left now. Now that I know how the control center operates, I'd like to go into another department, see how that department operates, and see what's happening, because that's what more or less the reason I'm down there for, you know? Well, tell us specifically some of the things that you do at the control center. Um, when I first came in to the uh, control center, they put me on channel 4, which is for stolen car reports or information, more or less, to the um, policemen out on the road. Then this year, when I went up there again, they put me on a complaint desk, where we, um, if someone is like a robbery or anything occurring on the streets or someone into the family disturbing something, they call us at the station and we answer the phones, we take the report, and we send it up to the dispatcher on channel one, which is the main channel, which operates over the whole city, and the cars take all the information from that channel. But then the last few weeks, they put me on channel one now, which is the main channel, like I said, and I've been working on that and they're teaching me that now. So I hope to know that by the end of June. I think I've accomplished more within the last two years than I would have there, I think, in four because of the opportunities I've had to open up myself at my own rate, you know, not at a rate where it is decided by the school department. Like, the most important thing to me is I have the responsibility now of my own education, and if I don't succeed, it's only my own fault and not the school department. The way people think, I, it's more or less like they've been trained to think the same, and uh, I just think there's a change, a need for change in this school and any other school, and I think in our communities where we live. But I think the students and the staff at AOP have, have opened me up to the problems of the world, problems of this country, and problems right in our city and in the school, you know. And then, of course, they can round this out with a variety of other areas, uh, doing work in traditional academic subjects as well. I guess, you know, one could spend lots of time talking about the curriculum and the course offerings. Uh, suffice to say, at this point, last year we had about 88, uh, last semester we had about 88 courses offered, uh, approximately half of which were, uh, were tutorials, about another 15 of which only included one other student, and over 50 site placements out in the community. <laughs> what happened during the beginning weeks of the Law and Justice Package? <clears throat> the law and justice package started um, when the law workshop met. Um, I guess there were about 14 people in it. 
and um, we talked about the possibilities of things to do. Um, the base, the, the basic elements of, of each person's schedule in the um, package was the workshop, which met two or three times a week. Um, a field-related course, which most people most people took the same one, which was a uh, criminal law course, and then, which has then evolved into a juvenile education law course, and has now presently evolved to a legal process course, and then <coughs> and lastly, people site placement. Um, site placement. I worked at Vermont Legal Services. So what was your experience like at Legal Services? Um, well, the way it started was, I guess there were four or five kids that were working in the main office that I was working in, and we scheduled our hours, and the guy who was our contact there just said, you know, go in and do do what you can, make your own contacts there. And I eventually started working with um, the lawyer there that handled most of the consumer cases. And uh, that was after about three or four weeks of filing <laughs> closed cases. What did that develop into for you? How did your feelings change about pursuing the law? It became more and more apparent that law was unlike any of the other packages where you could do things immediately and, and see what you were doing. Um, lawyers have taken a, a tremendous amount of information. You have to just know a lot to be able to um, do anything. And to get to know all those things takes a lot of time, a lot of discipline, and, and a lot of drive and it just got so frustrating I sort of lost all. So that you found the area to be dry and to be uninspired? Well, no, I, I mean I still think that it could be. I mean it was, law is a really interesting process. I just don't know that I want to spend, you know, more than seven years um, pursuing something that I think I would like. Was there a place at ALP that you could bring your frustrations to? Could you bring them back to the workshop or to your counselor? Or? Well, I, I think a lot of people were feeling that there were people, there were two people working at the Attorney General's office and they too, you know, were doing menial jobs or sort of on-the-spot jobs. I, they didn't really feel they were doing very meaningful things either. <laughs> It's generally felt throughout the law package that it's really hard to find things to do unless you find someone who's willing to um, either work right by your side. And of course, no one, no one who's doing anything worthwhile has time to do that in that area, or <clears throat> you know, to go and, and learn, go through law school, and get all that knowledge that you need to work with. Can you tell us about your background and the kinds of things that brought you to ALP? Yeah, it, it's been a long and funny road. Uh, I guess I've ended up here in, in Providence. And I guess it all began uh, undergraduate work at the University of Massachusetts, uh, in history and political science, uh, sort of playing around with the possibilities of doing some teaching, but not really thinking of it that seriously. Uh, then trying my hand at some public school teaching uh, up at Adams, up in the Berkshires, Graduate work at Yale in international relations, uh, working towards my PhD there, uh, taking all sorts of nonsense courses in pedagogy at the University of Bridgeport, uh, so as to get certified to teach a public high school, and then just a whole series of teaching assignments uh, in urban and suburban settings, uh, sort of culminating, I guess, as chairman of the history department in Wilberforce High School in New Haven. So I guess probably you know 10 or 11 years of high school teaching experience is very different. Also, I guess, what really came out of that experience in all those different kinds of educational settings was becoming convinced of how inadequate, how inappropriate high schools are as institutions which profess to serve the interests of, of, of young people. That 
for the most part, high schools, rather than meeting the needs of young people, really exist for the most part to, con to control. How did you learn about ALP? Um, my English teacher told me about ALP, like he summed up in five minutes, and then Dr. Visco, he's, he's the guy in the school department, came down to our school and talked about it. And he was really excited, and he was telling, he was throwing all these ideas and atoms, you know, how we would do this and this. Because it doesn't even exist yet, you know? And it was, I really felt excited. So I ran down and filled an application and hoped for the best. And then, like in, in June, I was rejected. And I felt really bad. I said, oh no, it goes another year central. And then four days before central opening, I found I was accepted. <laughs> I just went crazy. I mean, just, and then I, I went crazy about it, and I was really glad. So, I, and then I came down here and talked to Mary. And this school was one big room, and just I, I think it just explored my mind. And uh, it was really an experience my first year because I, the, I had all the opportunity to take all these kind of courses. So I I took all these courses, and then I like at the end of the semester I ended up dropping them half of them. I mean. For the first time, people listened to me, and, and it meant something, you know, that they listened. It was really crazy, you know, people said, I mean, the, the, the way people assessed, the way they, they treated you, it was a whole new thing to me, and, I, and, and the people, I, you know, I, was, I became aware of people, or, you know, the different lifestyles, and, you know, and the economic levels and stuff like that, it just a whole new experience. My first day, became aware. I mean, my awareness, I have been exposed to a lot of stuff, you know, and so I have become open-minded to everything I hear, and, and I've begun to question things and ideas, which I didn't do before because, um, I, you know, because Portugal was a very obedient society, so in Portugal, I never questioned teachers or, 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 or policemen or elders or my father and mother, so when I came to America, that's what happened. Now. I never question my guidance counsel or my teachers. So when he says be a secretary, I go, yes, I will be secretary. You know, if if you think that's good for me, then then that's what I'll be. But ALP, I become aware of myself and question stuff. You know, and I really feel I feel really good about myself because I'm doing, I'm accomplishing I'm accomplishing something that that, that I want to do. I'm learning more about myself and what I'm in what I am c capable of doing, not doing. And I think, you know, I really feel good about myself and it, will help, and it helps me day to day. It's just what possibilities do you see for yourself in um, the future? I'm looking forward to going to college. And like in college, will be a whole new thing to me as ALP, you know. I, w I want college to, to change me, like be a, another separate process. So that's what I want college to do for me. What colleges have you applied to now? I have I have been accepted at Franconia in New Hampshire and uh, Roger Williams in Bristol and Wyndham in uh, Vermont. <laughs> artist working out of her own studio uh, very different than say uh, taking art in the regular high school situation yeah because uh, there there colleges these days are just like pumping out teachers of all kinds they're pumping out art teachers too and all you got to do is have an interest and a slight talent and slap bam boom you're you know an art teacher but <coughs> she's mostly a professional artist you know it's her 
it's what she wants to do, you know, with her life, I guess. And just on the side, she teaches, tries to communicate some of her own, you know, insight to other people. workshop which in essence um, has starts out with um, basic leather working and goes into uh, more advanced forms of uh, leather working it's on a, a workshop basis on it's usually on a Thursday afternoon and continues during the week if kids have specific interests and also working on uh, with a design and construction package on building a kayak. This uh, includes uh, the design of the kayak, uh, building a mold, finishing the mold, and also <coughs> making a final mold out of fiberglass. <laughs> building things with their hands that way and, you know, just creating things from scratch. I think that I'd really like to have the students have an opportunity to address here at the school itself. It would be, what am I most competent at and what am I most fulfilled by? Or, you know, put it, put it another way, what am I good at and what makes me feel good? And I think for the most part, traditional schools are constituted in such a way as to not allow students to address that question adequately. I guess people would ask us, uh, what is it that we do so differently here that makes the addressing of that question possible? And I would, I would answer that it's, it's our approach to, it's, it's approached two ways. One is through the issue of community within the school itself, and the other is through the issue of community without, what happens out there in the city. And I would hope that one of the most important things that students do learn here within the school setting itself is how to relate and deal with other people in a more humane and decent manner than which is possible in these other corporate structures out there. And I guess by community without, through experiencing things directly firsthand out there in the city itself, and us together with them developing a conceptual framework for understanding those experiences better. <laughs> Joanne, what is the most important thing you do at ALP? Um, that's working in my medical care shop, where I can have different site placements working throughout the city. One time I was working in Boston City Hospital, where I was doing um, some research on pregnant women, doing research on microplasms, and taking vaginal cultures. 
person that was also working in Pleasantview School for Retired and Physically Disabled, working with the physically disabled children. But during, the, I think, the second semester, I, I'm doing a, now I'm doing sex counseling, where I went through training with the Boston Family Planning Project, where um, we did intensive um, training on counseling, sex counseling, where we counsel people for birth control, venereal disease in Boston. That I'm the youngest person in the group taking the training since I'm 16 years old and I'm also one of the youngest people in Providence to be a teenage sex education counselor as I'm called because of that I'm 16. How has ALP changed your feelings about yourself? What has it enabled you to do that you couldn't do in the school you were in before? Well one thing I realized is it enabled me to express myself more I've been working with a lot of people with my own age with the sex counseling and being able to let them know things about their bodies and how they can prevent different things from happening. And also the fact here working in the school, I've been spending a lot of my time with the black students in the school. We developed this area called the Black Library. And we branch off from people writing their own writings and putting up, putting up posters. <coughs> Um, we've been able to write our own things and put them on the board and being able to express ourselves how we see fit and for other people to judge them. You know, it, it really makes me feel good to know that, you know, I, I can say what I feel without, you know, being condemned for it. And I'm really close to the people here now. Is the sex counseling stuff something you see yourself doing primarily for, for black women because for them, getting the information about Planned Parenthood is a lot harder? Um, I don't try and reach forward to, you know, just blast the words. I try and reach everybody. But, you know, like, maybe, like, since how more of my friends are associated more with black people, I get over to the black people more. But, you know, like here in the school, there are more white students than blacks, and I be able to relate both to black and white. But I don't stress it in either, either way. What way has the experience here told you what kinds of struggles they should be working towards? This may be created a more unity between the black people here, but you know to come together to fight whatever struggle there may be. But as far as you know, like a big change, you know, like it's always been the same. You know, we we just are more united as black people here in the school. For yourself, how has it changed your own feelings about being black or being a woman? Or I don't know, maybe I'm not that I'm more aware of what's going on in the community concerning black people, um, what's going on among people themselves. You know, it, it's really created something, you know, really totally different, something I've never felt before, but glad that I've had this feeling of being able to help somebody and help myself while doing it the point of where I can express myself better. What other things in the medical area have been important to you? And I'm also taking a childbirth education course where I study um, labor during pregnancy, you know, going through labor with the women, being able to accept labor, labor as it comes. And also, like in my workshop, we have other students who are going off into different things. Some are working over in physical therapy at Rhode Island Hospital. And this one student, she's over in the emergency room at Roger Williams Hospital. And they're working in the Providence Health Center, helping with the patients there. And also over in Pleasantview School for Retired Physically Disabled. Yeah. Yeah. Like, talking about the school being a farce, I could say that, but... Like people talk about it from time to time, use it as an example of progressive education. Like it has a definite purpose and it's being used by the school department and different government officials. And of course the people have a good time here and they, they don't mind it. Of course they're really getting a good a good end of it in a certain way. It's no answer to any problem. Because in the uh, United States of America, the way this country is now, I mean, something like this is just um, keeping a few people contented, like the most discontented people. Um, last year, Larry Paris, the director of the Ultimate Learning Project, asked David Browning and I if we could put together a package in communications or 
an area of the school that would introduce kids to media, uh, different aspects of media. Uh, so David and I being interns and both of us being pretty new to the city of Providence, well, we just went around and, and talked to people in media, uh, television, radio, newspaper, uh, mostly local people like the radio stations WICD, WPRO, WDOM. And we talked to them, we tried to set up some kind of programs for high school students. Uh, some of the things that we've done, we've uh, created workshops in, in radio. Right now we're doing a, a community radio show down at WDOM in Providence, that's the Providence College radio station. There we were doing, mostly involved in a different kind of television. In the school, this school offered both. You could either work on a documentary form of television leading to, you know, exploring social issues, or you could do a more um, visual kind of television work, you know, kind of exploring video as an art. And that went pretty well, and it's, it's still going pretty good. <laughs> aspects of the school. I guess I would talk about parental and student involvement, the extent to which parents and students are involved directly in the decision-making process itself, through town meetings, through community uh, review boards, through the advisory council. There really is no generalizing at all about ALP students. They're all very unique, very different from one another. Uh, we have the whole spectrum of temperaments and abilities and interests and political sensitivities. I really don't know what the future holds for us. In one respect, I feel very excited about what the possibilities are for, our, for us, for the idea, for the process. I, I'm sobered by the possibility that we may not really ever be able to either continue or to thrive or expand what we have here. I guess what perhaps for me is the most sobering thought of all is the fact that no matter what we have, what, what we have done or, or have not done here, will not ultimately be the basis for the decision as to what happens to the project. <laughs> 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 